How does the Goblet of Fire differ from the first three novels? Okay, it's a lot darker. It's longer. Someone dies. How else? How, how about in the beginning? It opens instead with, like, hey, let's catch up with Harry. It opens up with this happened to the riddles a long time ago. Books one through three all start where? Harry, at Drive. They don't even start with Harry. They start at number four, Privet Drive. The first book doesn't start with Harry. Harry comes in the second chapter. Okay, He's talked about kind of in the first chapter. But they start at number four, Privet Drive. Book four starts where? The Riddle House. Riddle Hamilton, the Riddle House. Good. Okay. How are these spell with stupid name? The Riddle House. Where's book five again? Harry, again, number four, for the air high. Number six begins at the Ministry of Magic at Mom. And it's the Mom. Is with, uh, the Malfoy Manor. Yeah. Number seven is with Malfoy Manor. Okay. Or at Malfoy Manor. So, what is she doing in one through three? Okay, part of it is exposition. She's creating the background. She's creating the world. What else is she doing? By having each of them begin at number four, Privet Drive, she's creating a formula. We come to expect the book to open up, and we're right there with Harry. And then she throws us a curveball. It doesn't follow the formula. Why? Why does she do that? Because it's a sudden change. Okay, sudden change. Remember? And no one can really say because we're not J.K. Rowling, but we right. can only assume that it's the grower wrench and what we've already expected. So we're excited for it. We kind of like anticipate what it's going to be. And then, it's less predictable. Yeah. It's less predictable. What she's doing with this is she's saying, I'm not writing formula fiction. Formula fiction is a term applied to a genre of writing. Okay, that you've all seen if you've been in any bookstore, any non-university bookstore, where you go down the aisles and you see the yeah, I'll take it, it romance section, <laughs> Harlequin romances. Okay, or you go down the fantasy section. Okay, or the detective section. What is every piece of detective fiction? What's another name for it? Murder mystery. Murder mystery. Who done it? Okay. Agatha Christie wrote Who done it? Who done whatever the was thing that was done? So the the formula, you know, will differ according to the genre. But you have what are called tip sheets. Okay in publishing houses for formula fiction. The tip sheets will tell prospective writers what the book ought to include, how many words it ought to be, whether or not there should be a love triangle, how old the male love character should be, how old the two women, or how old the two men and the one woman should be. Okay, What should be their station in life? Are they lower middle class? Are they sharecroppers? No, never. Why? Because you want the characters to be, in this kind of in romance formula fiction, you want the characters to be people that you, the reader, can step into their shoes. So whose shoes do you, the reader, who is the intended audience, let's say, of Harlequin romances? Middle-aged women. What made Fifty Shades of Grey just off the charts? What was one of its nicknames? Mommy Porn. <laughs> Mommy ain't getting it home, so she's going to get it through a book, you know, so to speak. Okay? So, what does it mean? It's this idea that the reader can step into the shoes of a character. So, what do you want the character to be? Better than you higher than you. You want the character who you're going to identify with to be a jet setter? Someone who can fly to exotic places? 
do great work. Do we see this on TV? Yes. Do we see it in films? Yes. All the time. <coughs> so, rolling is showing I'm not doing that. You can't predict on the basis of books one through three necessarily what she's going to do in four through seven. Though, let me put it this way. You can see, once you finish all of them, book one, Parallels with book seven. Two is parallels with six. Three is parallels with five. And book four kind of stands on its own. Which is why I always describe book four is the hinge. Okay. It's the linchpin. You know what a linchpin is like this? You have a hinge like that. There you go. This is connected here, this is connected here, this is connected here. The pin that goes through is what? It's what connects the two plates of the hinge. Okay? Without this, these don't work. Okay? Book four is acting like that for the series. One through three together collectively point to book four. Five through six, collectively, all flow from book four. Okay? But we're going to see. Book one. How does Harry arrive? Nope. No, he remembers Hagrid on the... Uh, Hagrid on Sirius's motorbike. Book seven. How does he leave? With Hagrid on Sirius's motorcycle. Book one. He arrives without Hagrid, Hedwig. Book seven, he arrives at the place he's going, hate to give this away, without Hedwig. Yeah. Okay. I So, two has those kinds of parallels with six. Three has those kinds of parallels with four. I mean, who, who did we meet in book three? Excuse me, with five. Who did we meet in book three who was so important? Serious. Don't give it away. In case not everybody's read book five. Okay. So we open here, sorry, here in Little Hangleton. We open in the Riddle House. And what are we seeing? What are we witnessing? Before the murder. Gossip, yeah, about this one man who they say killed the riddle because no one knows what happened to the actual thing. Okay. What are we seeing at the actual riddle house? So we hear about, we're introduced at the beginning to Frank Bryce. We got to have Frank Bryce kind of describe. He's the old caretaker of the place. He was wounded in World War II. Okay? He stayed on even after the original owners of the house, the Riddles, died mysteriously. He was charged, but was never convicted. And who do we see in the Riddle house? Lord Voldemort, or as Tom Riddle, or Voldy, or as... Uh, he's going to call him Voldy Gun Voldy, okay? And Peter Pettigrew. What are they talking about? Their plan. Their plan to kill, abduct Harry Potter, etc. Okay? But what does Pettigrew suggest? To use somebody else. Let's use somebody else. Why? Because he's attached to Harry. Is it because he's attached to Harry? Is it because he really doesn't want to kill Harry? He's, no, it's is because it he's, he's kind of scared. Okay. He's kind of indebted to him. Yeah. Well, he is. I mean, Dumbledore told us that's in the previous book. He is indebted to him. My question's kind of getting at is what Pettigrew is doing here. 
Is this an indication of that indebtedness? Is this something on Pettigrew's part where deep down in the recesses of his heart, he feels like he owes something to Harry, and thus he is trying to protect Harry? Is that his motivation, or is it that he's afraid to try to get Harry Potter because he is being so well protected? What describes Peter Pettigrew's character? He's afraid. He's a coward. The idea takes courage, right? Where is Peter Pettigrew, from what we've seen of him, ever shown courage? He's not acting out of the largeness of his heart towards Harry. Okay? He says, in fact, when they're talking, page 9, Voldemort says, I could use another, another wizard. That is true. My lord, it makes sense. Laying hands on Harry Potter would be so difficult. What does he mean, laying hands on Harry Potter? Getting hold of him. Getting hold of him. So why does he say, getting hold of Harry Potter? Why does he say, laying hands? Okay, possible. If he touches them, it burns. Does laying hands suggest anything else? Depends on the question. Really yeah, the question depends on whether or not you have any kind of religious background or upbringing or Christian religious background. Yeah, it refers to healing. Okay, the laying of hands on somebody. Right. This is the first time she uses this kind of phrase, but we're going to see at the beginning of Book Seven. Right. Voldemort's going to be talking to his group, his, his uh, gang, let's call them. And he's going to use a term um, about a character who is now the um, minister for magic, or is about to be the minister for magic. He's going to say, once Pious Thickness, the name of this guy, has the ministry, she uses the word converted. Where do we use that kind of language? That is solely used in a religious context. You don't talk about people converting from Democrat to Republican, or Republican to Democrat, or Libertarian to whatever. Okay? That's religious. That, that implies turning completely away from one way of life to a new way of life. Okay? So she's introduced this kind of language here with laying hands. Laying hands on Harry Potter would be so difficult. He is so well protected. And so you volunteer to go and fetch me a substitute. What's Wormtail's idea? What's his, what's his proposal? Yeah, why? What kind of wizard does Voldemort need for his plan? His plan is to bring his father back, in case you haven't gotten that far. Excuse me. The plan is to bring himself back. Yeah, he's physically here, but he's here in a stunted, deformed way. He wants to be reborn to full body, full strength. Okay? So he's going to do kind of a black... Uh, anti-opposite resurrection, so to speak. Okay? So, he needs an enemy. Well, what is almost everybody in the wizarding world to Lord Voldemort? An enemy. But he doesn't want just any enemy. He wants Harry for a specific reason. Okay? So, he says, could this suggestion of yours be nothing more than an attempt to desert me? No, no, I would never want to just, don't lie to me. I can always tell, Wormtail. Okay. This is second time, I believe, we've heard Lord Voldemort say that. He says it, I'm pretty sure, at the end of the Philosopher's Stone. Right? When he asks Harry, what, did, what do you have in your pocket? When Harry looks in the, and Harry says nothing, he says, don't lie to me. Lord, Lord Voldemort always knows. 
Guess what? We're going to get to the end of book seven. Not always. Not even most of the time. Because he has one of the people closest to him lie to his face. And he's not aware of it. Right? So they keep talking about their plan. Frank Price comes in. Notice, Frank Price is in his little cottage. Right? And he sees what looks to be flames up in the old house. And what does he figure? That damn kid getting in the house again. Lighting fires, think he's going to burn it down. So he goes up. Notice, he goes to the house. And we're told, page six, back up a little bit. Frank goes to the front door. It's not been opened. None of the windows have been opened, so he goes around to the back of the house. And he reaches the door, almost completely hidden by ivy. Takes out an old key, puts it into the lock, and opens the door noiselessly. Okay? So there's the door, the back of the house. The door is almost completely obscured by ivy growing up the wall of the house. So how long has it been since someone has been in that door? Long time. Okay. This is actually happening over happening over 50 years after the riddles were filled. Okay. So it's been a long time since this door's been open. And he puts a key in, and the door opens noiselessly. If it's been opened, he's gonna do it. Okay. Did you hear just that little, just for a moment? Squeak. Okay. How often is this door open every day? Probably a lot. Okay. The door that has not been opened in, okay, let's say minimum 30 years. How's it going to open? It's going to squeak and make all kinds of noise. Why? Think of that linchpin again. What's it take to keep that thing moving? Lubricant. Okay. The lubricant becomes the actual opening all the time. It keeps rust from flowing, but nobody's gone in and out the store. Okay. So those hinges, if they're not rusted, they ought to be somewhat locked and frozen. So Frank shouldn't just be able to right in without anybody hearing anything. If you've ever opened a door that's been closed for 20 or 30 years, they open with a lot of noise. Right? I think it's just an example of Rowling not knowing what she's talking about in terms of writing. That she's never opened a door that's been closed for 30 years. So, Frank goes in, and it's through Frank that we're hearing essentially all this. Okay? So what happens? Nagini comes in. Voldemort tells Wormtail. Nagini is out, and Nagini sees this man. Frank comes in, and uh, Wormtail, uh, Voldemort says, page 14, you heard everything, muggle? Eh, what's that you're calling me? I'm calling you a muggle. It means that you're not a wizard. I don't know what you mean by wizard. All I know is I've heard enough to interest the police tonight. I have, you've done murder, you're planning more. And I'll tell you this, my wife knows I'm up here. Poor old Frank, he's not married. You have no wife, nobody knows you are here. You told nobody that you were coming. Do not lie to Lord Voldemort and Muggle, for he knows. He always knows. Again, he, you know, he's got this God complex about knowing. Right? So what happens? Wormtail turns Voldemort around. And almost even before Voldemort can curse him, Frank Bryce starts screaming. Now, this is the guy who has seen the horrors of war. But now he's seeing a new horror. And notice, we're not told a description of the thing in the chair. All we're told is that the thing in the chair raised a wand. 
cow. What does the thing in the chair obviously then have? Little hands, you know, maybe little T-Rex arms or something. But it's got arms, okay? Flash of green light, and Harry wakes up. What does Harry do? What's he start to think about? What happened last time his scar hurt? The Voldemort was near in the castle. Voldemort was near, okay? So he starts thinking, is Voldemort near? Okay? Yes? I wanted to say earlier on the door, um, just to give Rowling the benefit of the doubt, uh, would it not be possible that they could have cast some magic on the hand of the that so that uh, their yeah, entrance and exit would be that's what I'm saying. Right. Could be. How do you think Voldemort and Wormtail got in there, though? Maybe evaporated. Apparated. Yeah, not evaporated. It's a little bit different. Okay. Yeah, they probably just apparated. Frank Bryce can't apparate. Okay. Well, you said that the kids were, like, uh, these kids were going to help them, too, but the kids were just coming into the house like every night. Well, that's why he checks the front door and the windows. Okay. But we're told... Really see the back. Yeah, we're told this door is hidden by ivy. The indication there is if it's hidden by the ivy, then somebody hasn't gone up. What are you going to do? I mean, let's say you're wandering around Middle Tennessee. You find some old antebellum home that it's clear nobody's been in. Okay, first of all, I'm checking it out. Okay, if I find that house and I can tell nobody's living there, I'm inside. I'm going to, you know, walk inside because I like old woodwork and stuff. So, I find a door, and the door is covered with ivy. What am I going to do before I try to go in the door? You don't have to rip ivy. Yeah, move it out of the way, because what lives in ivy? Bugs. Bugs. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, we are speaking about the real world in comparison to a fictional world created by an author. Yeah. I feel like there might be some differences in that kind of sense. How so, though? Doesn't the fiction, shouldn't the fictional world still operate by... Certain laws? Only that were created by the fictional author. Okay. Where is this, though? That is, this world. fictional world is what world? In our, in our world. Is it our world? Or is it an alternate, an alternate Earth universe? So then it's like parallel. So you're saying it's like parallel? Well, that's what I'm asking. I think it's still our world. I, mean, I think Cameron's suggesting is that it's, it's not really. Our world, correct? Right. I've always understood it to be our world. It's just the parts of it that are, that where the wizards inhabit are, are hidden by magic. Okay. Yeah. Like Hogwarts. A big castle hidden, hidden by magic. It happens, but we don't know. But within the context of the novels, what is the impression that's given? That's where, for example, does Victor Crumb play for? Bulgaria. 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 And then you get one and where's where's Bobaton? France. Where do the Weasleys win the ticket to go to? Well, Egypt. Cairo. Yeah. Egypt. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I these are all real places, and I mean, you have to get to them by wizardly means too, like the certain places in the novel. So, uh, but I feel like that there's again something that couldn't be necessarily explained by just nonfiction works. I mean, like the, there are parts in this book that are completely magic. Yeah, I, I agree. And this is what Tolkien gets at in his, in his essay on fairy stories when he talks about the secondary world. Right? He says the secondary world is made up of what? If you've read this, it's made up of elements of our world. Why? Because none of us is God. None of us can create, quote unquote, ex nihilo, out of nothing. Okay? So what do we create with? we create with the materials of our world. Now, let me use another example that, that would prove Cameron's point. If you've read Philip Pullman's his Dark Materials series, right? Golden Compass, Amber Spyglass, and the Subtle Knife. They are set in an alternate Earth universe. That is, it's it's you know like the old Star Trek, the antimatter form of our world. That is, you have a London, you have an Oxford, you have an England. 
but they're not the London, Oxford, and England of our world. Right? My question is, is the London, is the Scotland, the Bulgaria, the France, etc., the J.K. Rowling situates her world in and around? Is it our world? Or is it a completely imaginary place? Similar, but not identical. Okay. Um, I would go based on the fact that the, the really common descriptions of models, like where, like, as like a broad brush painting, we are like all inherently stupid. Like to the point where we can't even spot the most obvious goings on in the wizarding world. Well, some do. No, we do. They just they come, right back. They come back. They come That's... back to make sure you don't remember it. Who, who, for example? Pretty much sees when magicians are walking around in capes. Uh, Vernon sees them. Vernon sees them because he knows what the rules are. Okay. Well, if you go by the example that um, like uh, platform nine and ten, whatever, and King platform Kong, nine and three quarter, um, right? Like they're they're not like nine is here, but ten right. is around the corner. Does a dish not actually? You know, it's not. This gets at something that we'll talk about more in book five. Because in book five, we see Harry discuss, or through Harry's perspective, we see Harry come to this conclusion that what he thought were two separate worlds are actually one and the same world. There's a point when he is sitting in his kitchen with the Dursleys after he rescues Dudley from Dementors. And Petunia starts spouting off about Dementors. And Vernon goes, what? What are these Dementians? And she says, Dementors. They guard the wizard prison of Azkaban. And Harry's jaw about drops. He's like, how do you know that? And she's like, how could I not know that? And she goes on this kind of rant. And it's at that point, Harry kind of uses this image. Here's our world. Here's what Harry thought was the wizard world. And he thought between the two, there was a door, or a portal, for lack of a better phrase. Okay? Platform nine and three quarters. I mean, you could say, this is King's Cross. Okay? And what he comes to realize is, no, 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 that's not how it actually is. They are one and the same. It all depends on what? Perspective. It all depends on sight. Okay. So, I think this is why she, why she situates it in our world. I mean, the London that she describes is our London. The highlands of Scotland that she describes are the highlands of Scotland. Okay. Um, are there deviations? Yeah, definitely. But notice, it's not like Middle Earth. See, Middle Earthy. I got to be careful. Here. Middle Earth is not our world. It's our world before. Adam and Eve. And just let that you know, sit there and put for a while. It's our world before Adam and Eve. Middle Earth does occur on planet, what we call planet Earth. Okay? But it's a long, long time ago. Long before Adam and Eve. This, Philip Pullman says dark materials, this is not planet Earth. It has parallels. You have a Catholic church. Okay? You have a, what's called the magisterium. You have an Oxford University. But the way he creates his world, he creates it in such a way that it's clear that this world is, again, like a parallel universe to our world. 
In fact, one of the things that he posits in here is that there are billions of parallel universes. One of the ideas in um, astrophysical worm theory is that the idea that there's multiverses. There is not a universe. There are multiverses. Okay? Possible billions of them. And that what we consider to be a universe is like a cell. A single cell of a human body. And the human body are all these multiple verses, so to speak. Yes, Cameron. Oh, uh, I was just going to say, uh, so there were muggles in a Diagon Alley, right? No. Well, well, oh, well take that back. Right? Hermione's family goes through. Okay. Yeah, Hermione's family does go through the Diagon Alley. They can enter, it's just not a normal thing. Don't, they should. Well, they go in with Hermione. Yeah. If you know, if you know where the leaky cauldron is, and you know to go out the back door, find the trash can, go up three bricks, and tap three times, <coughs> diagonal out of the opens. But you have to know that. Right? Don't you have to do the water? Well, Hagrid, you know, Hagrid uses an umbrella which has a broken one, well, so well, yeah, maybe that's. I don't know that she actually specifies that, but yeah, maybe. Or maybe you just have to. We don't know how people go the first time. You know, people get their letters, and on their 11th birthday, uh, they get their letters on their 11th birthday, and every 1st of September, what do they do? They have to find their way to platform nine and three quarters. So imagine if you're not raised in a magical family. How do you find platform nine and three quarters? Do you just kind of eyeball it? Well, that's nine and a half. That's, you know. <laughs> Or does somebody explain it to you like Molly Weasley does to Harry? Right? Um, so Harry wakes up and he thinks this is all what? He thinks it's all a dream. Right? But he starts to worry because of his scar hurting. And so what does he do? He runs through his mind. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a letter to somebody. Who should I write a letter to? Ron, Hermione, Sirius, Dumbledore. So what does he think Ron would say? I don't know. I'll ask Dad. I don't know if, if, if uh, cursed wounds, cursed scars are supposed to do that. Okay. Hermione says, write to Professor Dumbledore. Harry thinks of writing to Dumbledore, page 21. Sorry to bother you, but my scar hurt this morning. Yours sincerely. Ron, Harry imagines. But you know who can't be near you now, can he? I mean, you know, wouldn't you? Notice, Hermione immediately thinks, write to Dumbledore, I'll look at a book. Ron immediately thinks what? Worst case scenario. Voldemort. Right? Don't know, Harry, maybe cursed scars twinge a bit. Really? How many people have this kind of cursed scar? So they wouldn't know whether or not. Okay, So he thinks, I've got a godfather. I'll ask Sirius. So he writes Sirius. Okay. Um, he gets the invitation to the Quidditch World Cup with the Dursleys, with the Weasleys, excuse me. And then Mr. Weasley and Fred and George and Ron show up to pick him up. How did they arrive? Flew the Flew the through, through the flu network. Okay? So they arrive in the Dursley's family room in the walled up fireplace. Okay, so they arrive and they're now stuck in the wall. So what does Mr. Weasley have to do? He's got to do a little room remodeling. So they hear the voices, Harry and the Dursleys hear the voices, and then the wall explodes. What kind of impression does this make on the Dursleys? Wizards are the worst. Okay. So they get Harry's stuff. They get ready to leave. Harry gets ready to leave. And page 48. Ron goes through. <clears throat> 
And we're told, now Harry and Mr. Weasley alone remain. Well, bye then, says Harry. They didn't say anything. That is, the Dursleys don't say anything. You know, let's, let's try to be generous, or let's try to be fair for the Dursleys. What do you think is still going on in their mind? Or at least in Dudley's mind? Holy shit. <laughs> you blew up my freaking wall. That's, that's going to take a lot of money to repair. Yeah, let's fix it. Well, that's going to come up later. So, when Harry says bye then, what do you think they're thinking? See you. you know, don't come back. Don't let the broken wall hit you on the way. They don't say anything. Harry moves towards the fire. But Mr. Weasley puts out a hand and holds him back. Like he grabs him by the shoulder to stop him. Harry said goodbye to you. Didn't you hear him? Harry, it doesn't matter. Honestly, I don't care. What's Harry thinking? Just let me leave. Yeah. Just let me leave. He's thinking, freedom. Okay. I get to leave the Dursleys early. You aren't going to see your nephew till next summer. Notice what that's assuming. Harry's not going home for Christmas holidays. He hasn't yet. And he's not going home for Easter holidays. He hasn't yet. Right? So you're not going to see your nephew for nine whole months, or maybe ten. He said to Uncle Vernon in mild indignation, Surely you're going to say goodbye. Why? Why does he say that? What does he mean by surely? You're not that cold hearted, are you? Yeah. You're not that cold hearted, are you? You're not that horrible, are you? That you're not even going to say goodbye. Uncle Vernon's face worked furiously. The idea, notice how Vernon takes what Arthur is doing. By the way it's narrated, this is telling us, this is what Vernon is thinking. The idea of being taught consideration by a man who just blasted away half his living room wall seemed to be causing him intense suffering. In other words, you're trying to teach me, now the word that's used here is consideration. In other words, to be considerate. What does it really mean? The idea of being taught manners by someone who destroyed my house. It's kind of giving him problems. Would it give any of us problems? Yeah, I think it would. Okay. Does this put, does this paint Vernon in an extremely bad light? I don't think so. I think it portrays him in a natural light. Okay. But Mr. Weasley's wand was still in his hand. In other words, Vernon's not an idiot. He knows how the wall came to be the way it is. And Uncle Vernon's tiny eyes darted to it once before he said, Goodbye then. Notice, he says it resentfully. Okay. Why does Rowling include this little scene? Who is it intended for? Who is meant to benefit by this teaching of consideration? The audience. The reader is supposed to learn from this. Notice, is it going to work on Vernon Dursley? No. Why not? He's old and set in his ways. Does that mean he can't change? No. Rowling makes clear throughout the novels, everyone can change. Everyone can change. Okay? But they have to want to. Vernon doesn't want to. Okay? So it's intended for her readers. What, what's she doing? Why does she intend this for her readers? What is she trying to teach her readers? Consideration. Manners. So that when someone says goodbye to you, what is the lesson taught? You say goodbye. 
someone says hello to you, you say hello. You don't flip them off and keep on walking. Right? We're going to see in the next two or three books. She's going to do this repeatedly, especially book six, when Dumbledore comes to take Harry away. When he sits down with the Dursleys and gives them a little talking to. Right? Harry says, see you. Notice, it began with Harry saying, well, bye then. Right? Goodbye. See you, Harry says, as he walks on into the fire. And as he's walking into the fire, he sees Dudley choking and his tongue. Getting huge. Right? Notice she has this kind of serious moment, and what does she do? She lightens it with this humor. What kind of humor is it? <laughs> it's slapstick. Right? It's three stooges. It's three stooges. You know, yeah, 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 right. You know, fingers in the eyes kind of a thing. Okay? Whose expense is it at? Okay. Who's the bully? Fred and George. Fred and George, in this case. Well, precisely just Fred. Well, okay. Why? What does this show us? Let's say, compare Fred and George. In Dudley. Because Dudley had no right, or he didn't know better that it could have been magic candy or anything, and they still offered it to him. Okay, what is this? Let me back up for a minute. What does this show us about Dudley? He's greedy. <laughs> he's a pig, man. He is a pig. But he's also described at the beginning of the next book. No. It's this book. Yeah, it's this book. The size of a small killer whale. A baby killer whale. It's the beginning of the next book. Dudley's been working out. Dudley's joined a boxing club. Dudley is the Southeast champion. Okay? So, Dudley's ripped, in other words. Okay? But here, Dudley's just a big, fat slob who eats anything you throw on the floor in front of him. Not unlike Crab and Goyle, who will eat cakes that are left on banisters, just left there. Right? So, what motivates Dudley? Food, gluttony, sloth. You can kind of go through the seven deadly sins if you wanted to. Fred and George, are they motivated by gluttony? No, not really. Sloth, no, not really. Avarice, no, not really. What, what, how would you describe Fred and George in just a few words? They're class clowns. Class clowns. Pranksters. At the same time, they're extremely smart. Oh, yeah, they're... They're wild. They're serious in George's point. They're really smart. Okay. That's the only reason they get away with it. Otherwise, they would be... Probably expelled. Okay. But what can pranks... Might she be showing us? What can pranks lead to? Okay, think. Third book. What prank uh, was death. Sirius attempting to play on Snape? Death. They can lead to death. What could have happened with this one? It looks funny, right? He eats a tongue, tongue toffee, and his tongue grows four feet long and looks like a slug. Is is exactly. He could choke to death. He could he'd have choked to death. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Mm, taking the joke a little too far. Okay. So they get back to the burrow. Notice the difference between Arthur and Molly. Molly wants to do what? Yeah. 
Who do you want to get punishment from, Arthur or Molly? Arthur. Hagrid or Snape? Hagrid, man. You go off in the forbidden forest and hang around with monsters. You know, okay? Snape is a monster, so to speak. Right? So while they're at the Weasleys, they get their owls, or they find out, sorry, not their owls, they get their um, class lists and all that kind of stuff. And we're going to skip a bit. They go off to the port key. Page 72. They're getting ready to go to the Quidditch World Cup. And they meet up with the Diggories. So we have Harry, Ron, Ginny, I believe, Mr. Weasley, and then Amos Diggory and his son, Cedric. Page 72. Hermione's there, sorry. Uh, Mr. Weasley introduces them. Fred and George are there also, sorry. And Amos says, Merlin's beard. Harry? Harry Potter? Uh, yeah. Notice, everybody else knows Harry by sight. Maybe his bangs have grown long enough so you, know, you can't see the scar. Seds talked about you, of course. Told us all about playing against you last year. I said to him, I said, Sed, that'll be something to tell your grandchildren that will. You beat Harry Potter. Do you think Sed went home and said, Dad, guess what? I beat Harry Potter in the Quidditch match. Knocked him off his broom. Knocked him on his sorry little, you know. No. No. Harry couldn't think of any reply to this, so he remained silent. Fred and George were both scowling again. Cedric looked slightly embarrassed. Harry fell off his broom, Dad, he muttered. I, I told you, it was an accident. Yes, but you didn't fall off, did you? Always modest, I said. Maybe Dad could learn a lesson from son here. Always the gentleman. True comments, right? Mm -hmm. He is modest. He is a gentleman. But the best man won. I'm sure Harry'd say the same, wouldn't you, eh? What did Cedric try to do at the end of that match? Rematch. Yeah, he said, this isn't fair. He had like a hundred Dementors take him out. It's not, wasn't an even, one falls off his broom, one stays on. Notice, Amos doesn't look at the context at all. You don't need to be a genius to tell which one's the better flyer. Why the difference between Cedric and Amos? Cedric's more humble. Okay. But why? Why is, why is Amos the way he is? Okay. Okay. Say that again. Isn't he sort of a foil for, for Cedric? Yes. But my question still is why? What is Amos, what's he doing through this scene? What's, what's he suggesting about Cedric and himself? No, not actually. He's living through Cedric's story. In other words, what has Cedric done for the Diggory family? Trust the name of the Lord of Mourn. Harry Potter. But notice, Amos hasn't beat Harry Potter. Okay. Do parents do this? Oh, yes. Hell, yes. They try to live through their children. Uh, ladies, I'm going to all be sexist here. But, you know, assuming your mother is still alive, you get married. Whose wedding is that? Yeah, your mom's. You think it's yours, but probably for the majority of women, that wedding ends up being, even if the mom had the storybook fairy tale wedding, it's going to be redone according to what she thinks it ought to be. 
And it might be that she's doing this entirely for her daughter, but she's doing it entirely for her daughter because she wants her daughter to have the wedding she thought she should have had. Okay? Fathers live through sons through sports. Mothers live through daughters through weddings, I guess. Or maybe sports. Okay? So, they go off to the Quidditch World Cup. We meet the Roberts family, the Muggles. Notice whose, notice whose property they're at. Okay? We meet the Malfoys. And I love this line. Bottom of page 100, top of 101. Harry and Draco Malfoy had been enemies ever since their very first journey to Hogwarts. A pale boy with a pointed face and white blonde hair, Draco greatly resembled his father. His mother was blonde too, tall and slim. In other words, they're Aryans. They're Hitler's perfect, you know, uber race. Tall, slim. She would have been nice looking. What's that would have been mean? But she's not. Okay? Why? If she hadn't been wearing a look that suggested there was a nasty smell under her nose. So what does her face always look like? Yeah. <laughs> You've ever seen people like this? They just walk around and they're always, you know, like there's something wrong inside. Like, just loosen up, man. Just loosen up. Smoke some pot, you know. Just... Okay. So, they talk a little bit. Lucius belittles Arthur. And we see the Quidditch Cup, which I'm actually going to skip. The Vila, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Later on, they get back to their tent. And they start hearing noises. Page 119. They come out of the tent. And Harry and Ron see a crowd of wizards tightly packed, moving together with wands pointing straight upward. Wizards are all wearing hoods. High above them, floating in midair, are four struggling figures being contorted into grotesque shapes. So this pack of wizards, like a phalanx of wizards, is walking around and they're all holding their wands up like this. And there are four people up in the air being turned against their will. Okay. More wizards are joining the group. And suddenly, the floating people are illuminated. And we see Mrs. Roberts turned upside down so that her dress falls, exposing her undergarments. And the wizards laugh. Ron, that's sick. Page 120. That is really sick. Okay. Book five. Harry sees his father do the exact same thing. To suffer Snape. Hermione and Ginny come hurrying towards them. Mr. Weasley go off with Bill and Charlie to help the ministry. Harry, Ron, Ginny go off to the forbidden, uh, go off to the forest to get away from things. With Hermione, they run into little Malfoy who makes disparaging comments about Hermione, how she better not get caught or she might get turned upside down. Uh, I'm going to skip a bunch. They're hiding there in the forest, and all of a sudden they see, they're in this clearing, they hear Mors Mordre, and they see the skull up in the sky with a serpent coming out of its tongue, or like a tongue, page 128. Right. Hermione says it's the dark mark. Harry, Voldemort, Harry, come on. They hear <laughs> around them. And notice, Harry sees all these wizards and yells, duck, and grabs Hermione Ron and pulls them down. Right. Notice, Harry's the one who thinks quickly in the moment. Ron and Hermione, they'd be screwed if it weren't for Harry. I mean, they'd be stunned to... Uh, Incapacity almost. Right? Uh, so, the 
wizards have a look around, and we find Barty Crouch's elf, Wheaton, with a wand. Whose wand? The one that Harry's wand. Turns out to be Harry's wand. How do, why do Harry, Ron, and Hermione say Winky could not have been the one who made the dark mark? Winky has a high little voice like this. She says, I stop doing these things. She would sound like Moore's Mordra. And the voice was Moore's Mordra. Okay. But Winky's holding the wand. They know the wand produced the Moore's Mordra because they do priori and cantatum. And make it kind of come out. So Amos Diggory has the poor misfortune to suggest something about two of the people in that little gathering. He suggests, he implies, that two people there were somehow in the power of or able to be the one to conjure the dark mark. Bartimius Crouch, Barty Crouch, Senior in Harry Potter. And Barty Crouch Senior says, uh, page 136. Perhaps Amos is suggesting that I routinely teach my wizards, my servants, to conjure the dark. Amos, oh, Mr. Crouch, no, not, not, not at all, not at all. You have now come very close to accusing the two people in this clearing who are least likely to conjure that mark, Harry Potter and myself. I suppose you're familiar with the boy's story, Amos. Who isn't familiar with Harry Potter's story in the wizarding world? Other than Harry. Potter. Yeah. Adults are all familiar. Okay? But of course, everyone knows. And I trust you remember the many proofs I have given over a long career. Now, notice, at this point in the novel, we, the readers, have no idea what he's talking about. We know nothing about Barty Crouch Sr. We're going to get all that exposition later. Okay? I, I never suggested you had anything to, if you accuse my elf, you accuse me. Where else would you have learned to conjure it? Oh, picked it up anywhere. Really? What must house elves do? Serve the master, serve the house that they belong to. Can they leave that place? No, not unless they're ordered to or allowed to. Okay? So it's not like she's running to the grocery store and suddenly going to hear, oh, here's how you conjure Moore's Mordor, the dark mark of the greatest dark wizard who's ever lived. Okay? So Winky gets sacked. Harry, Ron, Hermione, go back to the Weasley's tent. And Ron asked, page 142, I, I, I don't understand about the dark mark. Why doesn't he understand about the dark mark? Okay, he didn't live through it. What else does he apparently never done? He's never read any books about the past. Okay. Yeah, he's never read, apparently, Hogwarts history. And you kind of even doubt that he's probably cracked the history of magic by Matilda Bagshot. So, Mr. Weasley says, Ron, you know who and his followers sent the dark mark into the air whenever they killed? The terror it inspired. You have no idea. You're too young. We're going to hear that phrase repeatedly. You have no idea, you're too young. Sometimes it's going to be, you wouldn't understand, you're too young. Okay? Sirius is going to say that later on. And Harry's going to say, or Ron's going to say, I can't remember which. He's going to say, you know, everybody says that. Why don't you try us? And Sirius is like, yes. All right. I'll give you the dish. I'll tell you. Okay? So. Just picture coming home, finding the dark mark hovering over your house and knowing what you're about to find inside. In other words, the dark mark was only conjured when somebody was killed. So, you get home, the dark mark's over your house. You know somebody's dead. 
right? Bill mentioned the Death Eaters. Harry, Death Eaters? What are Death Eaters? Really, it's what you know who supporters called themselves. Mr. Weasley says, ah, we can't prove it was them, Bill. Probably was. Ron, I bet it was. We saw Draco. And what does he say? He as good as told us his dad was one of those nutters in masks. We all know the Malfoys were right in with you-know-who. Harry, but, but what were they up to? Why were they levitating muggles? I mean, what was the point? What does this show us about Harry's character? He likes to see reason. Okay, what else? He doesn't understand doing things just for the sake of doing them. What do you mean by just for the sake of doing them? It's a very important For the fun of it. What's the it they're doing? Torturing muggles. Torturing muggles? Mr. Weasley, the point? Harry, that's their idea of fun. Half the muggle killings back when you know who was in power were done for fun. Okay? Read an account the other day, or I didn't actually read the thing because I didn't want to fill my mind with the crap. It's on the headline. ISIS executed six young boys for playing soccer with a welding iron. They had a mass execution yesterday, day before, of some of the free Syria uh, soldiers. Some of the stuff they do is for fun. Saddam Hussein and his sons, back when they were in charge of Iraq, they used to do some pretty sick stuff for fun. Putting their enemies in chipper shredders, for example. Like the big ones that you see trees going into. Okay. I suppose they had a few drinks tonight, couldn't resist reminding us all that lots of them are still at large. Nice little reunion. Ron, but if they were the Death Eaters, why did they disapparate when they saw the Dark Mark? Notice, Ron's using logic. Hey, I thought the Dark Mark was supposed to draw them. Why did they disapparate? Use your brains, Ron, says Bill. In other words, Bill's saying, go a little deeper in the logic there, Ron. If they really were Death Eaters, they worked very hard to keep out of Azkaban. Because what happened to all the others? They're all in jail. They're all in jail. Okay? And they told all sorts of lies about him forcing them to kill and torture people. I bet they'd be even more frightened than the rest of us to see him come back. And they denied they'd ever been involved with him when he lost his powers. Hermione, so... Whoever conjured the Dark Mark, were they doing it to show support for the Death Eaters? or to scare them away. Mr. Weasley, your guess is as good as ours, Hermione. In other words, we don't know. Notice, they don't know who the Death Eaters were. They don't know who conjured the Dark Mark. They don't know why the Dark Mark was conjured. Okay. Chapter 10, Mayhem at the Ministry. What do we find out? Rita Skeeter, we get introduced to, has written an unflattering article about Mr. Weasley and his comments at the Quidditch World Cup. And notice, who doesn't come firmly down on the side of family? Percy. Percy. What does Percy say? Well, you know, Dad should have got permission of his head of office or something like that. Who is Dad's head of office? Uh, that would be Dad. Okay. But what is Arthur doing giving any kind of statement? What is Arthur's office? Misuse of muggle artifacts. Should he really be one giving a statement to the press about a terrorist incident? Not really. Okay. Um, that's on 152 and following, by the way. 